Yes, sir. We are live. Over to you, Ravi. Yeah. Uh, good evening, everyone. And I am Dr. Manish Dhawan, and I am the moderator of this session. And I welcome you all for this uh, distal radio ulnar joint instability, the webinar. And this is a initiative, combined initiative of Indian Orthopedic Association and the Hand Society. And Dr. Pankaj Jindal, a uh, very renowned hand surgeon in India, will be conducting this webinar. And uh, I express my greetings from the IOA president, Dr. R.C. Meena. He is unable to come, but he has said his greetings, and he might join us in uh, middle. And now I request Dr. Pankaj Jindal to introduce himself and Dr. Richard, our guest from Netherlands, and start the webinar. Dr. Pankaj Jindal, please. Yeah, thank you, thank you, Manish. Okay, presentation. Share the hmm. Ravi, am I visible? Yes, yes. Yeah. Okay, Vis visible, uh, sir. You can go ahead, sir. Uh, good evening, everybody. Uh, we are going to talk about distal radial nerve joint instability here. And uh, okay, this is a part of a, a significant number of uh, problems that is occurring on the ulnar side of the wrist. And distal radial nerve joint is one of the common manifestations of pains and instability uh, occurring on the ulnar side of the wrist here. There are a lot of things if you see the wrist as such, the pain on the radial side, pain in the center, and pain on the ulnar side. In this five by three centimeters, almost 50 things are happening here. To stabilize this unstable distal radial ulnar joint, a lot of operative procedures have been described since 30s. And they went on for almost about 40, 50 years. They were basically trying to hold the radius ulna, and unfortunately, none of them worked. And then came in 2002, a procedure which was uh, trying to create anatomical reconstruction of distal radial ulnar joint here. Then this was further modified by Mark Henry here. And then further research and implementation of the research led to another uh, uh, identification of another structure, the distal oblique bundle of interosseous membrane. It was found in significant number of people when this was reconstructed, led to alleviation of pain of DRUJ instability here. But when the patient comes to you, he comes with one of the three problems. He comes with pain, he comes with a lot of function, he comes with deformity. What he ultimately wants is to get rid of the problems and he wants to get all right. What does the patient understand of his problems? He understands almost nothing, whether he has read whatever on the internet here, Ultimately, he wants a treatment which is cheap, which is effective, which is fast, and is long-lasting. Does it matter whether the treatment is anatomical or non-anatomical? It doesn't matter to him. He wants patient to be all right. And as far as we as surgeons are concerned, we want a treatment which is simple, which is quick, which is reproducible, and which has least complications. And patient says, Doctor, you operated me 30 years back and I'm perfectly fine now. You don't want to operate something today and next year he comes to the doctor, it's still hurting. So you want least complications and treatment which lasts forever. So here we have to speak about this. None other than Professor Rickard Koch from Netherlands here. He is, is a, is, was trained in Rotterdam. He had his fellowship at Nalabuff in Boston here. He's a senior hand surgeon in an expert clinic at Rotterdam, Amsterdam, and in The Hague. He's a fellowship trainer here in Amsterdam here. His multiple presentations here and multiple publications. If I read this, probably he'll not get any time to make his presentation here, but many and many publications which have come in from Professor Richard here. And he was a co-founder, the most important thing, in these 15 years for the Dutch Risk Society. He has made a first, uh, a big uh, foundation for establishing a very reputed Dutch Risk Society here. And what interested me the most was his article. Can you see this? All highlighting that I have done is in his article. I have read this article thoroughly here. And which was uh, the most important thing that I learned in this article was an extremely simple procedure can really stabilize this uh, problem. Having said this, I hand over 
uh, the screen to Professor Rip, Robert here. Uh, Richard here, I'm sorry. I'm sorry for the brother. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. <laughs> Richard here, I'm sorry. Over to you, Professor. Thank you. <laughs> well, okay, thank you very much. That's very kind of you. Okay, I share the screen now. <laughs> Robert Cobb was very good. Doctor. He was a real professor, actually. <laughs> I'm sorry. Okay. No, no, no. It's fine. It's fine. Okay. Okay. So let's talk. Um, let's talk business now. On the. Let's try okay. to. Yes, yeah, that's right. Is it visible for all of you? Yes. Do you see the presentation? Yes. Perfect. Okay. Good. So. Um, Thank you very much for uh, joining in for the second time. Now, last time uh, I forgot my uh, my presentation, but um, I think I can do it right now, um, as with this uh, with this presentation on uh, on the wrist pain, but especially on the instability of the distal radial ulna. Um, uh, of course, everybody understands that um, for us, it is as wrist surgeons, it's very important to understand the meaning of anatomy. Because if you don't understand that, um, it's very difficult to start treating people or at least understanding their problems. Now, um, if you start looking into the study books, there is a problem because if you look for, for example, TFCC, you will have a variety of, of, of painting schedules, um, schematic uh, drawings, et cetera, et cetera. But it, I doubt if if you really understand it, if you compare, for example, these four pictures, they have a, such a variety that it's difficult to make a good interpretation. So if you would like to make a good interpretation of the wrist, especially on the owner side of the wrist, uh, if you have the opportunity, do a dissection. And uh, a fresh frozen cadaver is the most, um, uh, it's the best, specimen to do your uh, dissection on. Um, I understand that uh, that, that is uh, uh, not too, too, too cheap, but if you can form a group with, for example, uh, 10 uh, surgeons and uh, you go to one fresh frozen uh, cadaver and do your dissection, that will be very uh, profitable for, uh, for all of you. So uh, let's go to the common causes as was pointed out um, by uh, Pankai. There is a variety of diagnosis, which is related to ulnar wrist pain. Starting with uh, a simple synovitis um, due to usually some soft tissue degeneration uh, by mechanical forces or by disease. Then, of course, you have the TFC lesions. You have the tear in the subsheet of the uh, sixth external compartment. You end as we are speaking now of Drew instability, but also ulnar carpal abutment, the osteoarthritis, the fractures and the pseudotrosis of the PSU, and uh, finally the PT osteoarthritis between pisiform and triquetrum. So there is some, um, some diagnosis which is uh, related to ulnar wrist pain, and these diagnoses you have to try to put into anatomy um, to understand them and to treat them. Now, for stability, um, of course, it is. It, there are so many structures that have some meaning in stabilizing the distal radial ulnar joint. I agree completely. But for me, um, there are three significant areas of mechanical importance of the TFC. That is, on the dorsal side, the dorsal radial ulnar joint. Can we? Just yeah, a it's in the way. Okay. Oh yeah, that's good. So, so actually, um, we have the distal radial ulnar joint, we have the volar um, uh, the, uh, radial ulnar joint, and we have the foveal area. Now, here you see some schematic draw drawing. This is probably a little bit better. You see that the TFC, the the, the ligaments are having a superficial point, uh, portion, which goes into the styloid and a deep portion which goes towards the uh, fovea. So uh, that is congruent to the, to, the, to the palmar side and to the dorsal side, so the drill and the furl and the fovea 
as I always understood, were the most important structures. So if you have an instability, at least you have you need stability of this structure. And of course, there also is a contribution, for example, from the subsheet of the ECU and the stabilizing effect of, uh, of the tendons uh, and the muscle power. But basically, these have to be intact to create stability of the distal radio ulnar joint. Okay, the onset of uh, the complaints, uh, as we all know, are acute or chronic. Uh, usually it's, uh, it's an acute, uh, powerful rotation or ringer trauma or, or with tennis or golf, uh, a radial deviation force. And patients tell you often that they heard or felt an acute snap in their wrist with pain on the ulnar side. It also can be chronic with a gradually developing uh, ulnar wrist pain which may be re work related. And uh, that, may be go that may be going in episodes of pain, but they usually are related in diminution, uh, in diminution of their activities in daily life. So it's a variety of pain, usually around the ulnar head. They experience a click sensation in full rotation or deviation. You have a reduction of the fist grip and you have limitations in daily life functions or even so worse that they can't participate in their jobs. So if we uh, then go to the physical examination, I have the honor to introduce you my uh, dear son, uh, Nicky. Nicholas, Hi. a doctor, his doctor in Amsterdam, um, who will demonstrate uh, together with me what uh, a patient, uh, how we investigate, how I at least do the, the investigation uh, at the, uh, at the to medical practice. So um, the first thing we do is look and compare. So uh, we ask the patient, okay, if uh, show us your both hands and forearms in different uh, positions, in this position, then in the position of the neutral position and in full pronation. And we ask the patient, do you see any difference because what we see is probably not always what the patient sees. So the patient has to give you an answer on that question, which may be a lead um, towards the diagnosis. That is the first thing. So we look. And as much as you see, because there's often a swelling, some redness or whatever. And then we do the palpation. Uh, sorry, we do the mobilization. We see how the mobilization is of the wrist. So we do the... Uh, the, the extension, we do the flexion. We ask the patient to put the elbows on the table in a neutral position. Uh, and then we ask them to, uh, to do the ulnar and radial deviation and ask them if it's painful or that they experience a click. When they have done that, then we fix the radius with the forearm in perfect uh, inflection in the elbow and the thumb towards the nose. And we ask the patient to relax their shoulder. That is very important because if they do not relax their shoulder, there's too much tension also on the forearm. And if we want to do the shift test, it's stuck. But if you release, then you see it is moving. So, the shoulder, the whole arm, the whole extremity should be in a relaxed position. And that gives you an opportunity to start to do the shift test and do the ulnar compression test. So the ulnar compression test also I always do with the in a neutral position. And I really give good compression and make some torsions and ask the patient if that is painful. Um, and I do that on both hands. It's very, for me, it's important, of course, always to compare. Um, and um, that, is, that is most probably the best to test the, uh, the distal radio ulnar stability. Of course, we also have to palpate. Palpate the distal radio ulnar ligament from the dorsal side, just at the dorsal end of the Ulnar, ulnar head, really press 
and people often say that is painful. You can also go in the uh, length direction in the drew. Sometimes they they give pain there. You can palpate the PSU and just volar to that. There is the VRUL. And if there is pain, then probably you have some problem with a synovial uh, tissue around that area of the v of the volar side, the VRUL. And finally, we have the extension of tissues between the ulnar head and the carpus, the ulnocarpal collaterals, which may be part of the six subsheet. And if there's a tear there or a synovitis, and you can press there at that point, just distal to the PSU, that gives you a lead to the anatomy and the problems perhaps in that area, which I call the ECC or the ulnocarpal complex as ligaments. So um, that, is, that is what I do. And of course, always compare with the, with the other arm. Um, and, um, of course, we have the, uh, the diagnostics, um, the pain x-rays, most likely the arthroscopy, and in rare cases, the ultrasound uh, and the MRI or the CT. Now, on plane, dynamic X plane or dynamic X-rays, we, we usually already can see a lot of problems like osteoarthritis in the distal radial ulnar joint, ulnar minus or, uh, or plus or neutral with the uh, abutment syndrome. We can see the width of the, uh, of the drew joint, which may indicate severe problems with the uh, soft tissues. We can diagnose the fractures or the pseudoarthrosis. And also, we look carefully for some perhaps uh, bone resorption, which is a sign of long-standing uh, synovitis. Then, if we do an arthroscopy, we do always a dry arthroscopy. I started with with uh, wet arthroscopy, but um, also after visiting uh, Paco Pignol, I turned to uh, dry arthroscopy because it gives you the best possibility and I can show you that to uh, give a good uh, uh, a judgment on the on the on the tissues in the uh, ulnar uh, part of the wrist and what I do is apart from looking also testing mechanically the quality of the uh, TFT and that is so important much more important than any MRI you can do because you can't test but with your probe from the 6R uh, entrance you can test by pulling pushing in a vertical direction testing the central part and the fovea, or by pulling from volar to dorsal, hooking, um, the, and you can, you can also see that there's lack of tension or not. And of course, we can use a needle test or the hook test for judging the foveal and uh, ulnar attachment. Um, just to give you a, a, a few ideas about that, here's the vertical pushing. You can see there, there, there's complete laxity of the TFC also with a, a radial tear, but that's that's not really uh, very important. Important. This gives you an, an idea how loose this area is at the foveal area. But also here at the dorsal part, here's the draw, and this is this is weak tissues. Um, this is weak tissues, and that is important because that gives you an impression that this this tissue is not good. The connection between the draw and the more dorsal tissue is in a bad shape. So, um, sorry, if I get a minute was not. So we did the vertical uh, testing, but we can also pull in a uh, from volar to dorsal. And here you can see that, and you can see that the, that the, the tension is increased on the. You see on the TFC, and that is a sign that the there's something with the drill, the DRUL, in connecting with the, uh, the tissues around the ulnar hand. So in this case, we would certainly do a reconstruction of the fovea and a reefing of the drill, as is projected in the, um, uh, in, in, in the article in the, in the wrist. So MRI for the instability, uh, we hardly ever do that. Inconsistent. Uh, we, we, 
we tested the, uh, uh, we did a um, uh, for 12 pa or 14 patients we uh, or 15 patients sorry um, we had an, uh, a small uh, 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 investigation and we could see that the MRI was inconsistent with oscoscopic diagnosis in 12 patients 80 percent in only 7%, there was congruity between MRI and arthroscopy. There was 93% that the arthroscopy was the guide for treatment. And in all cases, when we had the MRI shown to different radiologists, we had 15 different diagnoses with the same MRI. So an incredible inconsistency between radiologists itself. So that's why Arthroscopy is for us the golden standard. Um, I think um, this will, uh, especially in young younger people, we have of course uh, a lot of uh, TFT uh, um, problems. Um, I think we skip this. This is uh, this is fine. Um, okay. The thing with uh, with uh, arthroscopy is that you see a lot. Um, and of course, you 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 came there, your diagnosis, but, but always be critical and don't always uh, believe what you see with uh, arthroscopy because it will be sometimes not too helpful. Um, the surgery for Drew instability. The surgery, as I said, is restoring the soft tissue balance regarding three point stability of the drill, the drill, and the fovea. During surgery or during the reefing and really the, 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 the reefing, the fixation, you always have to do that with the arm in uh, a neutral position. That means flexion in the elbow and again in neutral position with the hand on the side table, pointing the nose, uh, pointing the thumb towards the nose of the patient. If you do your final um, uh, stitching or, or reefing. Um, what we do is uh, we open here from the ulnar side with a hockey stick incision. We open the sixth and the fifth uh, tendon sheet. Here is the ulna. Um, and you see that, that the ulna comes up a little bit high. And if we compress the ulnar shaft, you will see that it goes down a bit. From here, it goes down. That is already the first test of... <coughs> Uh, of what we do directly during surgery. And this, this tissue here may bulge a little bit as, it, as if it is too much uh, volume uh, of tissue. Um, this is here the, uh, the fifth compartment, the sixth compartment, the ulna, and this is the area you're going to operate in. Now, what is important is to, um, to, to, to uh, locate the drill um, and we make, therefore, an incision just at the distal rim of the ulnar head and about four millimeters or five millimeters more distal in the capsule so that you isolate the, uh, the drill. And that's really a sort of a chip, a flap, which goes down towards from here down to the central portion of the TFC. Is that understandable, I hope? because it's important to isolate the drill itself. Then if we bring the, uh, the arm in the, fore, in the neutral position, you can here clearly see the drill. There it has the extension towards the central part. Here's the ulnar head. And this is, this is the tissue which you're going to use to, to put the stitch in. So we pulled now on the drill from volar to dorsal and we, uh, put the PDF uh, 2.0 uh, through it and we connect it to the collateral tissue around the ulnar head and you see now that there's tension on the drill and we add three or four other stitches and that's all that's all you do so then you have a fixation more or less soft tissue fixation from the drill towards the dorsal part of the ulnar head if there is an additional, uh, like in this patient, uh, foveal uh, uh, loosening, then I prefer the, uh, the transosseous pull-through technique added to this procedure. 
So either you only do the reefing or you add the pull through technique. And um, uh, as uh, Dr. Gina already pointed out, we have written this uh, article, um, presentations, um, most as a result of trauma had the problems, positive TFCC compression tests. Thirteen of uh, yeah, practically half the patients were unable to work. So there was a lot of reason to do their repair. The mean follow-up was two years about. And um, seven of all patients in clinical drew stability with these combined techniques. So either a reefing or a reefing with foveal exertion. And you see that uh, it's about it's about the same portion which which needs a reefing only or a reefing with a foveal, a foveal reinsertion. The test score improved. Uh, there were a lot of people that uh, could regain their work uh, fully or just partly, and there were only two patients that were not able to work again. The risk score is favorable, and um, as I said here, the complications is more that uh, in the first year, people can complain from hypersensitivity of the scar. But um, we use this, oh, sorry. Um, Osop treatment, six weeks immobilization in a neutral neutral position in a long forearm, upper arm cast, six weeks thereafter of hand therapy, and from week 12, full function and weight bearing is permitted. So we see a lot of uh, top golfers and top athletics, and they are all back after uh, three months uh, with full weight bearing. Years, which is possible, of course, we use the Adams procedure or the final, uh, uh, um, the final solution, uh, the shaker uh, prosthesis, <clears throat> which is a very good uh, uh, arthroplasty in my uh, experience, but it's a very uh, expensive uh, prosthesis. And uh, but but as a salvage procedure, uh, it's 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 a great uh, great alternative. So um, that is uh, about all. Thank you very much. Give me the time. Uh, I don't hear you. Yes, sir. Ah. Uh, something. You have a slide here. Oh, sorry. No, 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 no. We. Um, th this is it. Fine. Okay. Uh... Thank you. Uh, uh, that was very interesting. Uh, may I invite the audience to for the questions, please? While uh, Neeraj and Ravi are uh, getting the questions, my first question, Professor, you mentioned about. Uh, the tear of the sixth com uh, compartment subsheath. How do you diagnose that sixth compartment subsheath tear? Can you diagnose it clinically? Uh, clinically, just by compressing, um, by compressing just distal to your PSU, there's an area related to the ECU. And if you compress there, then people sometimes uh, they have pain, which sometimes also goes into the, uh, goes more proximal. Um, and that may be a sign of a uh, uh, sinusitis due to a tear in, 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 let's say the owner side of the, of the six uh, uh, compartment. You mean you are, uh, if this is my styloid, Allah, yeah. this is my triquitrum, you are somewhere between these two? No, a little bit more volar, Palmer, oh. Palmer, yeah, there. Okay, so are we in the fovea? No, we are. No. Yes, the fovea is more uh, volar. The fovea is more volar, and I think it's very difficult to 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 make a compression and reach the fovea because it's much more hidden be, behind okay. the standard process. So, um, what is there? What could be also that the extension of the TFCC towards the ulnar carpal complex, towards the collateral sheet. Which includes the subsheet of the uh, sixth compartment. Am I? I may go back to the presentation. Do you have it in? Um, sorry. Um, share screen. If I go on the lower side, lower panel. 
Uh, als ik nog eventjes de dia uh, erin kan zetten. Ja, ja. Ja, ja, ja. Oké. Okay. This is a very sorry. This is a very schematic drawing, right? Very yeah, schematic. Absolutely. Part drill. If you can press here, you you have to imagine that uh, the standard process is going there, right? Right. If you press there, then this is an area also that if you open uh, uh, up the sixth compartment, you sometimes see on the on the, on on the side of the compartment some redness and some uh, some 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 flimsy tissue. Um, All right. from, from the arthroscopy, probably you already had seen already some synovitis from the inside. From the inside. But it's consistent with the outside in the sixth compartment. And <clears throat> this area here is an overflow area from TFCC into the ulnocarpal collateral bands. And that area sometimes has just synovitis within the tissues, <clears throat> or there is there are little tears. So when that is the case, um, I always uh, not only inspect, but excise the synovitis and then also stitch that, uh, that tissue. And, uh, is that more or less clear? Okay, sure. Now, the, what is the suture material that you use for suturing that uh, dorsal capsule? What's the suture material? 3-0? PDS, 2-0. 2-0, 2-0, okay. 2-0, yeah. Uh, the important thing that you said about examination is relaxing the shoulder because we always said relax the forearm. Yeah. But adding relaxing the shoulder adds a, a abundance of a relaxation of the distal part. So that was extremely right. important and useful uh, point in the examination yeah, that you, you mentioned yeah, about yeah, yeah. relaxing the sure. shoulder. Now you mentioned about dynamic uh, plane X-ray. Uh, you mean a clenched fist view or something else? Yeah, clean, the, the clench and also the deviation. I'm sorry, say it again. And the deviation, ulnar deviation. and radial okay. deviation. Okay. Yeah. You take uh, ulnar and radial in PA or AP? AP. AP, okay. Now, uh, that was extremely important. Again, an additional thing that you mentioned about was the MRI can be uh, misleading. Yes. Because not only the reports, but the interpretation and the findings can mislead you. And therefore, uh, arthroscopy becomes the bottom line for uh, making a firm diagnosis. Is that Absolutely. right? Absolutely. Absolutely. And um, misleading um, also for the, for, the, for the radiologists themselves, because uh, as I said, we have three radiologists um, asking them to give a comment on this, uh, on, on the same MRI. And they never were congruent in, in, in their uh, diagnosis. And, and then uh, the interesting thing was also that when I came back with them and showed them the result of the arthroscopy and we sat together comparing the MRI and the arthroscopy, they all had to admit, yeah, but the MRI is not, um, doesn't have the significance uh, as uh, from the eye. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so first up, up front they earned their money, but then afterwards they said, yeah, yeah, but it's not not really the best to do. I think there is a place for MRI though, um, and that is um, if you have uh, problems with, uh, for example, uh, if you want to if you want to get a good idea of uh, some uh, processes into the bone itself, for example, in the ulnar head or in the lunate or the triquetrum. For example, due to uh, abutment yes. or uh, due to chronic synovitis, uh, looking for cysts, uh, etc. That that may be helpful. So that uh, there are also in arthroscopy, we don't have to uh, think that we reveal all um, by by looking because we only look into the into the joint space, but not under. Yeah, you can look under the uh, the TFC if you have a, a big radial tear, but um, uh, but but in the bone you cannot look and 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 at some positions uh, you also miss 
uh, uh, you miss parts of the of the anatomical elements. Okay. So in so, some cases, yes, I do an MRI, but it's very very rare. So you will always combine MRI, no, and an arthroscopy, both. No, but I hardly part? have. I I trust on my arthroscopy. Oh, okay. So MRI is not a mandatory thing. Not, not at oh. all. No. So, so suppose you have fifty patients. How many of you, in general, I would say, uh, you will ask for an MRI? If it's for uh, instability, zero. Oh, okay. So maybe a rheumatoid uh, where you have a lot of synovitis, you will say probably yes, MRI to see yeah, where all the synovitis. A rheumatoid, uh, perhaps uh, two or three in fifty. And but you are looking mainly for abutment, as you said. Yes. If, if you have a pronation and ulnar deviation, which is painful, and you are suspecting an abutment, you'll get an MRI to look for uh, some bone edema. Is that right? Sometimes, sometimes. Sometimes. Okay. But if it's if it's very clear, uh, for example, in the picture uh, on the X-ray, you see already some changes in the cortex uh, of the lunate or the triquetrum, usually the, cort the, 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 the cortex of the uh, of the lunate, the ulnar side, then um, then I don't do an MRI. I go for an arthroscopy. Um, usually, it, or 90% or 95% of the cases, it is proven indeed that it's an infection uh, syndrome. And uh, you can, uh, you can with, with, with the, uh, the, the, the Fraser, you can uh, take away the, uh, the cortex of the uh, lunate um, and then create um, more space. Just by, 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 by taking away with your reamer, bone reamer, uh, the sclerotic uh, uh, cortex of the lunate. Okay. That means that you end up with a hole, right? But yes. that is, that, 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 that's fine. That's fine. That works. Okay. If you have an, <laughs> now it's a different thing, but if you have an impaction, what's your operation of choice? Uh, uh, a shortening or uh, uh, yeah, a usually Usually on a shortening, okay. but if um, if it's if it's very located localized on the uh, on the owner side of the uh, lunate, then I do this uh, reaming of the uh, of the uh, arthroscopically re uh, reaming of the of the cortex there. Cortex and of uh, cortex huh? of lunate. Cortex of, of uh, lunate at that part because the the cartilage is gone there. Sometimes there's a loose flap. You have to you have to get rid of that because that gives the painful click. So you take that part away. Then you look clearly on the cortex of the lunate, and with a with a bone reamer you can you can excise that. And you go for two or three millimeters into the bone, make a nice make a nice sort of hollow, um, shallow hollow, and 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 most of the patients are uh, relieved by that. If that doesn't help in a few cases, then I do an ulnar shortening. Okay. Uh, so will that be a secondary procedure, uh, doing ulnar shortening? So, yeah. Uh, if if I if it's necessary after, uh, yeah, I understand your question. It it if if it's a very small part of. Um, of, of contact, which is the problem. Then I do this arth arthroscopic procedure. If it's a wider, also including um, the lots of de degeneration of the of the central part of the TFC, then I do an ulnar shortening. Oh, okay. Now, because there's an impaction, you will also see a lot of attrition of the uh, the central part of the TFCC. Yeah, right. Uh, and so because it is central, it is uh, avascular, you are just debriding, that's all. Yes. Now, there might be situations you have, an, in addition, an instability. So uh, will you uh, stabilize it in the same sitting or yeah. do it separately? Yes, yes, yes. If I do an arthroscopy, I usually tell the patient I do the arthroscopy, and depending on what we see, uh, we do uh, uh, clearly a direct reconstruction. Sometimes it's not clear, but I always uh, give uh, discuss this on beforehand that uh, the diagnosis may be followed directly by treatment. I think okay. that's much better for the patient as well. Sometimes it is it is only the, um, 
you know, sometimes it's very clear that the that the instability is there and the uh, foveol uh, is uh, damaged and the, the drill is very loose. So so that's clear. But sometimes it's it's not as clear as it is. And I just limit it to a synovectomy because usually there is this superfluous uh, uh, mucosal uh, hypertrophic uh, tissue at the dorsal side of the ulnar side of the wrist. And I remove that. I sometimes do some reshaping of the TFC and I leave it uh, then um, and hope for the best. Uh, usually the patient is uh, under uh, uh, plexus anesthesia, regional anesthesia. So during the operation, I can show the patient what happens. I can show the patient the pathology or the things you can see. And I discuss during that operation also directly if we go on with reconstruction or not. And I explain them why the choice is made like that, and that 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 is fine. That's good because the end the patient then understands also what the doctor's thoughts are and what uh, what made him do what he's doing. Okay. Now, when you're doing the shortening of the ulna, is it uh, in the distal quarter of the ulna or it's more proximal? Because if you do proximal, you are going to tighten the distal oblique bundle as well. So, any yeah. comment on that? Yeah. yeah, yeah. Wafer procedure I do not like too much. You can do That's that right. arth arthroscopically, but uh, but I hardly do that. Um, so I usually do uh, a shortening of the shaft, three to f three millimeters usually, three to four millimeters. Stabilize it with a plate, and that is uh, all. And you're right; it it may induce extra stability to the druid joint. So you do it in the mid third of the ulna. No, no, no. I do it about uh, the, the osteotomy, usually about five centimeters proximal to the uh, to the ulnar head. I uh, try because... to, to stay as close to the uh, to the ulna because the condition of bone healing is there better than mid shaft. Okay, uh, because I thought if you do more proximal, because the distal oblique bundle in the is in the distal six centimeters of the uh, forearm. So yeah. if you go more proximal. Then probably you'll be able to tighten the DOB as well. So I yeah. thought. Yeah, but, but but do you very strongly believe in that? I'm sorry, say it again. Do do, do you really strongly believe in, in, in these forces which you can which may contribute? Uh, I don't know. I read it somewhere uh, uh, about uh, doing it more proximally, and that's why I'm asking you. Well, um, actually. Uh, the combination of instability of the drew joint together with problems of, of, of impaction, of abutment, do not occur too often together, in my experience. Oh, okay. So, so um, first of all, I don't have too much experience in, in the effect of the owner shortening in regaining stability of the drew joint. Uh, because... If, I, if there is an obvious instability, I do a reefing uh, uh, usually because it's, it's, it's 10 minutes work extra. Yes. Yeah. Uh, uh, there was a slide that you showed that fish tank and you said, uh, uh, don't uh, believe what all you say. What was that? I missed that point. <laughs> well, it was a little bit of fun. <laughs> yeah, but you learn a lot of things out of fun. <laughs> But what was that? I can you see it? It's just, you know, it's just saying that as the MRI sometimes gives you false hope or false information, also um, an arthroscopy may be judged differently with different colleagues. Okay. So you always have to be very critical in what you see. Um, and uh, for example, if you see uh, this little. Um, uh, Wait a sec. If you see this little fish swimming uh, during surgery, then uh, you probably see your shrink and not perform any uh, arthroscopies anymore. Did okay. you copy? Yes. Mm -hmm. Good. So it's it's more or less a job. It wasn't it wasn't to uh, to take too serious. 
Okay. Uh, one more thing. Uh, you mentioned about a significant number of patients getting that uh, scar sensitivity. How long that lasts and why it should? Because we aren't seeing, we don't have a big nerve around there. So okay. Why you, you have a large number of patients who had the sensitivity. Yeah. Well, it's 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 not um, uh, it's not for 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 a long time that they will have. Okay. Sometimes it lasts up to one year this sensitivity, oh. and it okay. may be it may be in 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 an effect on the on the on the scar healing, um, uh, or it may be. Of course, you have to 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 uh, if you if you do this ulnar incision as I do, and not the dorsal, but the, but the ulnar. Because I want to open, I want to open the sixth compartment to have a look at this area of uh, of where a lot of problems may occur as well. As I explained, the extension of the TFC towards the ulnar collateral ligaments, some tears which may occur there. Um, so, so I feel comfortable with with making this this hockey incision as we as we. Um, and that is close to the to the small bundles of the uh, of the ulnar nerve. And um, as we not had neuroma pain, but it may be that sensitivity because of that may be somewhat aggravated. I don't know. It's it's something we uh, we could uh, objectivate, and uh, we had to mention it, of course. But I think if you ask your patients um, and ask them for for scar tissue uh, pain, then um, then then. A lot of patients will initially say that that it's indeed it's a little bit uh, too sensitive for for wearing braces or a watch. Uh, that takes some time before they are uh, comfortable with that. Okay. Uh, you mentioned about hand therapy. Anything other than mobilization of the wrist? Any particular muscle strengthening? Uh, does it contribute to uh, enhancing uh, healing? Uh, what yes. Therapy? Um, as most of the, most of the patients are quite young in our group, I think the mean age is uh, something like uh, 35 or so. So the, you, you're dealing with, uh, with young patients and, uh, if they go out of the plaster, they are advised, advised to go swimming. That's the first thing they do swimming. to release their elbow, to release the elbow and swimming is very good because you use your, your full, uh, arm your wrist, your hand, your fingers, and it's comfortable. Um, so they, uh, they are uh, encouraged to do that. Uh, if they come to the therapist, the therapist will, will uh, guide them through the program with doing the, the active uh, exercises, pronation, supination, etc. cetera. Um, and they will give them uh, uh, some instruments to start train their fist grip with some instruments. It's very simple, actually. Any, and, sorry? any particular muscle uh, group that you want to strengthen? Nothing. No. Nothing no. in particular, in general. No. no. And general. Swimming, swimming really helps yes. the patients uh, very much. It's a good, yes. good exercise. Yeah. Ravi, we, I'm sorry. Uh, Ravi, please, the audience. Any questions from the audience? Meanwhile, I know that has been uh, very enlightening. Yet, we learned a lot of things here. Not yet, sir. Not yet, sir. Okay. No. Okay, uh, we have no. still uh, 14 minutes to go. <laughs> Any more questions? Otherwise, uh, what, 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 what is your, um, the, you said you, you, you are doing this uh, reefing, uh, the stabilization as well. Yes, um, I have done this reefing uh, and uh, two of my patients uh, work in the hospital themselves. And mm -hmm. uh, when I was preparing for this webinar uh, two months back and uh, I started collecting all the information and those were the two patients because of the COVID, I just couldn't reach out to all the patients, but two were immediately available. And they said, we've almost forgotten about we had surgery. So it's a fantastic okay. operation. Yes, yes. But because it is so simple, it is yeah. so easy, it scares me, will it work? <laughs> it is so easy to carry out. So I was, I was yeah, not yeah, sure. I can imagine, yes, yes. That's why it's good for me because I hate complicated, uh, complicated operations. That's what I said in the beginning of before your talk. Uh, from the surgeon's perspective, we want a simple operations, but because it is so simple, uh, the first surgery I carried out, I was in the back of my mind. I was not sure it's going to work, but it did. That's right. And therefore, I have gone on 
to do it uh, more regularly. Yeah. So it's a fantastic operation. It's a, yeah. it's extremely simple, and you yeah. really should encourage uh, this procedure in yeah. uh, most of the yeah. places. And yeah. if you have uh, a foveal uh, disruption, how, how do you repair that? Okay, I, very honestly, uh, we are not used to arthroscopy so far. We have started doing, but not very regularly. So I'll op formally open it and repair to the fovea, open. And then I'll do a capsular uh, in addition. So it's an open surgery. Okay. But how do you fix it? Do you fix it with a MyTech anchor? Or oh, no. Uh, I, no, no, no. I just uh, tie it on the shaft of the Allah. Okay. I make two holes and tie it on the shaft of the Allah, okay. uh, having a bridge of periosteum there. All right. Yeah. Uh, ultimately, let's be very honest again. Uh, finance is a is a concern in a significant number of population, and therefore adding ITEX, which are uh, would mean another maybe whatever dollars. So, yeah, that's right. That's right. So yeah, we save on that MyTech yeah. suture. I does, understand. Uh, uh, does it make a difference? No, not using a MyTech or interference screen. I, I, it does not make I, a difference. I, I, I so. don't. I don't feel comfortable with MyTech. Uh, yeah. Because I think that uh, the good thing of a, of a transosseous stitch is that you really hook the stitch and bring it down towards the ulnar head. I always ream also the the ulnar head to to get rid of the of the sclerosis or or the cartilage which is there, so that you have good contact um, between the the tissues, the soft tissues of the TFC and the ulnar head, and. Um, well, that, that usually uh, helps with uh, a long-standing stable uh, result. Okay. So yeah. that's another interesting thing. Uh, MyTech, uh, uh, Professor Richard is also not using MyTech uh, very regularly. No, to because, anchor, because yes. the contact is too, is too shallow. It's only, only a, a two millimeter point where if you have a bridge, uh, if you do, do your transosseous uh, uh, stitch, um, then you can make a bridge of, of, let's say, three, four millimeters, which is much more firmly for the attachment, in my idea. Okay. Yeah. Ravi, any questions from the audience? Not yet, sir. Okay. Uh, any more questions? Professor Richard uh, will not be able to get you very soon again because uh, you are an awfully busy person. Thank you. <laughs> you want to share anything more here? You, we still have another nine minutes to go. <laughs> Well, it, it may be a little bit late in uh, India now as well. So, uh, yes, almost six in the evening, but still. Anyway. Oh, still okay. Uh, oh, that's Ra not too late. Ravi? Yes, sir. Uh, if you don't have any question for Professor Richard, then I can share my screen and for yeah, the sure audience. Sir. Sure, sir, please. Okay. Just let me stop the Richard, sir. Uh, okay, Professor Richard, thank you. You're welcome. It so, was very nice. It was very nice uh, joining uh, the meeting. And if I can be in the future of any help, please let me know. Yes, yes. Uh, now that you're committed here and uh, you are a part of our family and uh, we'll not let you go. <laughs> Thank you very much. And uh, good health to all of you, your family and your colleagues. And uh, I hope um, we at some time meet uh, at the conference. Sure. Thank you, Professor. Thank you. Welcome. Bye-bye. Bye-bye to everyone. Bye-bye. Bye. And thanks to Nikki also. Sure. Okay. Thank you very much. Bye. Okay. 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 Can I share my screen? Yeah, sure, sir. Please. Bye. Can you see my slide? Yes, sir. Okay. So, uh, uh, this is uh, uh, what we had learned, uh, only a few things, because that webinar was a goldmine of academic contents. I have been seeing that, making uh, notes on whatever, and trying to convert into an article for IJO, because the amount of information we gathered in those three and a half hours was phenomenal. Uh, we had a lot of uh, extremely good and uh, stellar of uh, uh, international authorities in risk surgery, and they contributed tremendously to our understanding of DRUJ problems from examination from biomechanics to salvage procedures. And as I had mentioned earlier, it is difficult to remember almost 30 or 40 uh, pathological procedures pro problems that are occurring on the other side of the wrist. And unless we have follow a sequence and therefore make the examination more systematic, 
we are going to end up in a maze of complex problems there. And therefore, have your examination in a very good sequence here. And the simple thing is a follow of five story uh, sequence and begin from the proximal to distal and from the back of the wrist to the front of the wrist. Importantly, it is not only the wrist because distal radial nerve joint forms uh, part of the forearm joint. You start your examination from the elbow joint because the patient in the past may have had uh, uh, heel sex loprestry and now the presentation is the wrist. And therefore, again, always start your examination of the elbow and then go more distally here. In the back of your mind, project all the bones here, the ulna, the, the lunet, the triquitrum, the hamet, and the capitate, the triquitrum here, and the fifth metacarpal. And once you project these bones in the back of your mind and palpate each of the bone, each of the structure between the bone, the overlying structure, the tendons of the ligaments here, on the dorsum of the wrist here, and look for the most importantly, don't do a half hazard examination, pick up the tip of, with, with the tip of your finger, look for the point tenderness. The moment you are able to localize your examination to a single point and then focus and dilate that area here so that you can pick up the diagnosis in that area here. So this will be the five story that I have mentioned earlier here. One is the, the, the ground floor is the distal radial nerve joint. The second floor will be the ulno carpal joint here. That's where the TFCC will be lying here. The third floor will be the mid carpal joint. Then the intercorporal joint, which will be the fourth uh, floor. And the final will be the fifth floor, will be the carpometacarpal joint. So if you follow this sequence, first on the dorsum of the hand, and then go on to the volar aspect, you are least likely to make uh, you are least likely to miss a diagnosis here. But if you have this jumbled appearance, you will be very confused and you are going to mix uh, miss uh, an extreme important finding here and therefore have a particular sequence here. Follow this five story and you will not miss anything here. Coming to the review of ulnar sided risk pain webinar that was organized with your help, Ravi and uh, Professor Manish here and uh, Neeraj and Ashok. This one extremely important. If you can lay hands on this thing, please go over it again and again. You will learn a lot of things here. We had a lot of faculty from Jeff Ecker in Australia, from Professor Gebor in Germany to Mark Henry from USA, uh, Paco Penal from Spain, and we had Sanj Kacker from USA and Stephen Moran. And of course, we again heard Professor Richard Koch today here from Netherlands here. What we learned from this uh, presentation, this webinar from Professor Stephen Moran was not only about the anatomy, biomechanics and examination. The important thing that we I remember was when you are repairing the distal radial joint instability, it is not just only the four wheel repair that you must concentrate on, but also the peripheral part which goes and attached to the capsule and the ulnar stellar process. If you confine your repair only to the fovea, you'll miss the second component of the DRUJ stability and therefore have this repair at these two places here. And therefore repair is not only to the fovea, but also to the stellar process here. The next thing about the distal oblique bundle, it's uh, evolving lately. And we have seen quite a few papers from uh, European uh, countries uh, European countries, but now also from the USA. And one important development that we have noticed is if you can repair or reconstruct the distal oblique bundle, which is in the distal six centimeter, the radius, often you will be able to stabilize the in the unstable DRUJ here. You need not do anatomical repair as shown in Adam Berger procedure here. Uh, Professor Richard, if you're there, this is what I was uh, mentioning here. This is a distal oblique bundle here. If you do your shortening here, you will, if you do your ulnar shortening more proximally, you will tighten your DRUJ also. And therefore the suggestion here has been to shorten your ulna, ulna more proximally here. And this came from Razo. And again, I think this was from Mayo Clinic here. Another interesting thing that we learned in the webinar from uh, Professor Moran was in America and USA, this is not a very, uh, popular idea to excise the distal end of the ulna. They feel if you excise the distal end of the ulna, 
the ligaments, the allocarpal ligaments become flap, floppy, they become loose, they become lax, and they lead to instability. And therefore, instead of excising the ulnar head, they prefer putting a constrained or an unconstrained joint there. Whether that's the need of the hour will be seen by us over the next several decades here. But meanwhile, unless you have no problem, in our part of the world, we can still excise this head or the Savekapanji procedure, which is excision more proximally here. And then the next thing that we heard uh, from uh, Professor Moran, which you see, which whose uh, picture you see here, if you are doing a large shortening, you do not really have to worry about the shape of the DRUJ, whether this is oblique this side or oblique this side or is vertical, because they have not seen eventuality any noted any clinical problem about the shape of the DRUJ here. Uh, we have another one minute here. In the examination, the most another important thing that he mentioned was about the squeezing this thing here. If you squeeze, probably you will be able to find out if the patient has a, uh, an early onset of arthritis here. Then the next thing that he mentioned, if you are seeing a patient's complaint, the complaints can fall in three categories. Pain alone, pain with instability, and pain with arthritis. If the pain alone is a presentation, it's probably the central part of the TFCC which is uh, affected. If it is pain with instability, it is probably the peripheral part that uh, the volar or the dorsal radiocar ulnar ligament which are uh, damaged in pain with arthritis, of course, the joint cartilage is fired here. So if you have a patient uh, with pain alone, probably it is the central tear, as I said, or it is a split ligaments or synovitis as you see in a rheumatoid patient. And if you are picking up this thing, the ulnar foveal sign is has been mentioned here. And uh, you go on the ulnar side of the flexor carpalaris and press distally and deep inside volar to the ulnar uh, stellar process. If this is tender, the problem, this is where we are palpating. And this is the, the thumb of the examiner here. This is the area you are going to palpate. If this is tender, this suggests the possibility of a ligament tear, the allocarpal ligament, allotricotral ligament, which is damaged here. Coming to the ulnar impaction syndrome, I was, uh, again, it uh, said if you are walking into a risk clinic, probably every second patient will have a ulnar impaction. And therefore, it's an extremely important diagnosis for us to learn. Keep the wrist into pronation and ulnar deviation if this is painful. It is highly probable the patient has an ulnar impaction syndrome. And then another important thing that we learned in this clinical examination, then I'll wind up, is this patient presented with a primary diagnosis of AVN of the lunate. Not that we see anything sclerosis here, but the primary physician had made a diagnosis of AVN based on the MRI. But MRI edema is very specific. What you notice here, the edema is localized to one focus. It is not generalized. So if the edema of the lunate is not generalized and it is focal, this is probably an impaction and it is not an MRI, it is not an avian of the lunate. So again, as you notice here, the affection of the corner, only a segment of the lunate here, and this is impaction syndrome and this is not avian. Because it was avian, if you happen to do a shortening of the radius, the patient will be in a worse situation. And therefore here it is probably shortening or excision of the part uh, as a debridement of the lunet, as Professor Richard just mentioned here. So uh, this is, I think I'll wind up here. So I thank you again. Uh, any comment on this uh, from Professor Richard, if he's still there? Yes, no, he's gone. He is gone, sir. Okay. So with this, I think, uh, thank you. Any, everybody here, Ravi and uh, Professor Neeraj Bijlani and um, Professor Manish here. Uh, any question from the audience? Not yet, sir. Okay, so I think with this, we wind up our session here. Sure, sir. Sure, sir. Okay. Uh, Neera, sir. Neera, sir, are you there? Uh, 
Neera sir, just let me ask him. I will share the recording with you, sir, of this. Okay. All right. With the subtitles. Yeah, I will try to uh, transcript, sir. Try because uh, we had those subtitles in the last webinar, and it was a big help because a lot of uh, the, uh, the uh, uh, it did really help uh, understand a lot of words which I was not able to understand because of the uh, definitely, accent. Definitely. So are we done with this webinar? Shall I stop the streaming? Yes. Okay, thank you.